Hi, we're coming to you from the Western booth here at Equipment Expo 2024. This year we're featuring a one-of-a-kind D-Day themed military plow honoring all who serve. An iconic and most enduring photo of appointed Supreme Allied Commander Dwight Eisenhower speaking with troops the day before they were to depart for Normandy because wars aren't won by armies, they're won by individual soldiers. Someone alerted the group that Eisenhower was present and jitters started to set in with paratroopers ready to go. Upon greeting his young troops, he tells them that full victory and nothing else is expected. As Ike was speaking with one troop, 22-year-old Lieutenant Wallace Strobel, the picture was taken. His unit comprised of citizen soldiers of the Wisconsin and Michigan National Guards. Before his death in 1999, Strobel was asked about the conversation he had with Eisenhower. He asked my name and which state I was from, Strobel related. I gave him my name and I said I was from Michigan. He then said, oh yeah, Michigan, great fish in there. Been there several times and I really like it. Allied code names for the beaches along the 50 mile stretch of Normandy coast targeted for landing were Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juneau, and Sword. 12,000 planes of the Allied Air Forces swept the Luftwaffe from the skies while Allied ships protected the English Channel. Airborne troops from the United States, Britain, and Canada trained and rehearsed for their role in advance of the amphibious landings. Their mission was to secure the flanks and beach exits of the assault area. The 1st Infantry Division was commonly referred to as the Big Red One because of the large red number one on their shoulder patch. The complexity of their mission at Omaha Beach was unlike any of the others. Omaha not only had harsh waters and terrain to maneuver in, but it was also one of the most restricted and heavily defended sections of the beach. For that reason, the combat season 1st Infantry Division was chosen, among other elements, to complete the task. Being true to their motto, approximately 2,400 soldiers made the ultimate sacrifice that day. However, it was not in vain. Thanks to them, more than 34,000 Allied troops were able to land at the beach by nightfall. During the next five days, the Big Red One drove inland and secured the remaining beachhead for the arrival of additional troops, equipment, and supplies. Subsequently, the division moved eastward across France and spent nearly six months of continuous fighting against the enemy. By the end of the campaign, 17 of its members were awarded the Medal of Honor. The 101st Airborne Division 1st Demolition Section was assigned and trained as demolition saboteurs to destroy enemy targets behind enemy lines. They were ordered to secure and destroy bridges. Half were killed, wounded, or captured on the jump, but the rest accomplished their mission. They assisted Allied forces by utilizing CRN-4 beacons. Once activated, these enabled them to guide in subsequent airdrops of supplies crucial to the continued resistance of the 101st Airborne when the unit became trapped. The unit had a tremendous mission focus, but their disregard for aspects of military discipline that did not contribute to the mission became the bane of most officers. The 13-man unit acquired the nickname the Filthy 13 while living in Nissen huts in England, refusing to bathe during the week in order to use their water ration for cooking game poached from the neighboring manor. Photos of the men wearing native American style mohawks and applying war paint to one another excited the public's interest in this unit. The inspiration for this came from Sergeant Jake McNeese, who was part Choctaw. The 2nd and 5th Ranger Battalions played a vital role on D-Day by capturing and disabling a German coast defense battery high atop a cliff at Point du Hoc, in German meaning Point of the Mound. The defense battery high atop a 100-foot cliff was capable of raining down destruction on both Utah and Omaha beaches. The Rangers were the first to land in their section of the beach and faced intense machine gun fire and grenades. The battalion used grappling hooks during the DD landings to help them climb the cliffs at the Normandy beaches. The grappling hooks were fired from Allied landing craft to the top of the steep bluffs at Point du Hoc. The U.S. Army Rangers used the long ropes to quickly scale the cliff sides and escape the enemy. When the grapples failed, they resorted to using 100-foot ladders and a variety of ropes provided by the London Fire Department to scale the cliff. These arrived late after long delays. Once arriving at the top of the cliff, the Rangers discovered the six powerful German coastal artillery guns had been moved and dummy wooden barrels in their place. Despite fierce resistance, Rangers headed southward and found and destroyed the large guns. Nearly 400 of the original 1,000 Rangers were killed, wounded, or missing. The Rangers epitomized the strength, adaptability and determination of every service member who participated in the D-Day landings. 
The success of the invasion seemed most dubious at Omaha Beach, where the American GIs remained pinned down, unable to move forward onto the bluffs from where German troops poured murderous fire. Successive waves of infantrymen attempting to come ashore only added to the chaotic situation. Battleships and destroyers were ordered to provide close-in fire support for the troops stuck on the beach. The USS Texas had been providing gunfire support for the Rangers at Point de Hoc and the landings at Omaha Beach. She started at a distance of 12,000 yards. Now navigating at a range of 3,000 yards, her guns did not have the elevation to lob their shots inland as required. To get their shots off the starboard side had to be lowered. The starboard torpedo blister, a sponson on the hull below the waterline, was flooded with water. This listed USS Texas two degrees to the starboard and gave her main batteries enough elevation to complete the fire mission. Infantry medical battalions served as divisional medical units to furnish medical support for the infantry division. They trained with the infantry, carrying first aid kits instead of weapons. They dodged bullets to tend to wounded soldiers, sometimes with whatever supplies they could find. And even in the midst of thick combat, they remained steadily focused on their mission of saving lives. They were the combat medics of World War II. No amount of training or planning could have prepared them for the casualties inflicted during the largest amphibious assault in history, D-Day, the Allied invasion of Europe. The medical battalions were charged with the evacuation of all casualties from the infantry battalion and the regimental aid stations. Collecto clearing companies would also remove casualties from the field. Upon arrival, battalions could only render first aid for their equipment had not yet arrived. By evening, two stations were set up one in a tank ditch and another in a pillbox. Landing with their respective combat teams, they were pinned to the beach. Called Band-Aid Bandits, they cared for the wounded and the dying when they heard Doc or Medic. These brave men responded. The 261st handled casualties on Utah Beach. They were also responsible to evacuate patients to the United Kingdom. The 61st operated the only dental clinic on Utah Beach and evacuated casualties by air and sea and the 16th Infantry performed difficult duties under dangerous conditions, surpassing all expectations. Nurses played a key role on D-Day, including U.S. Army nurses, flight nurses, and British nurses. Nurses were no strangers to combat. They played a pivotal role during the Allied invasion of Western Europe on D-Day. Throughout World War II, nurses were almost always near combat while serving infield and evacuation hospitals, as well as aboard trains, ships, and transport planes. Though ever in danger, they focused on caring for others. Fewer than 4% of the American soldiers who received medical care in the field or underwent evacuation died from wounds or disease. The Normandy American Cemetery and Memorial in France is located in colville sur mer on the site of the temporary American Saint Laurent Cemetery established by the U.S. Army on June 8, 1944 as the first American cemetery on European soil in World War II. The cemetery site at the north end of its half-mile access road covers 172 acres and contains the graves of 9,389 of our military dead, most of whom lost their lives in the D-Day landings and ensuing operations. On the walls of the missing in a semicircular garden on the east side of the memorial are inscribed 1,500 names. Rosettes mark the names of those since recovered and identified. All proceeds benefit Camp Hometown Heroes.